Good evening. I'm Mike Perry, Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. The foundation is the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, a component of the U.S. Army War College at Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. The center is the Army's premier research facility dedicated to telling the Army story one soldier at a time. Tonight, we are pleased that our program again is hosted by the Enterprise Holding Foundation. Tonight's speaker is Chris Kolakowski, who was born and raised in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He received his BA in history and mass communications from Emory and Henry College and his MA in public history from the State University of New York at Albany. Chris has spent a career interpreting and preserving American military history with the National Park Service, New York State Government, the Rensselaer County Historical Society, the Civil War Preservation Trust, Kentucky State Parks, and the U.S. Army. He has written and spoken on various topics of military history from 1775 to the present. He has published two books with History Press, The Civil War at Perryville, Battling for the Bluegrass, and The Stone River and Tohola Campaign, the Ar This Army Does Not Retreat. In September 2016, the U.S. Army published his volume on the 1862 Virginia Campaign, a part of the sesquicentennial series on the Civil War. He is a contributor to the Emerging Civil War blog and a study of the 1941-1942 Phila campaign entitled Last Stand on Baton was released in late February 2016. He is currently working on a book about the 1944 India-Burma battles. On January 6, 2020, Chris became director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum after serving as the MacArthur Memorial Director from September 2013 to December 2019. Chris, the floor is now yours. Mike, and thank you for having me tonight, and, and thank you to the audience that has shown up and, and is interested in hearing the important story of the defense of the Philippines. Um, it's, it's great to be able to share this history with you all, and, and I'm very impressed with what the Army Heritage and Education Center has been doing, and, uh, and, and it's, if you haven't been up to see what they've been up to, I highly, do, highly, highly recommend um, going up there to see it. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the defense of Bataan and Corregidor, um, which is the period basically December 8th, 1941, which is the beginning of, the wor of World War II in the Pacific, um, all the way through the surrender of Corregidor on May 6th, 1942. Um, it is the largest battle the United States Army fights since 1918, between 1918 and basically probably 1943 or 44, depending on how you score it. It also is the largest surrender in American military history. It is a defeat. It is the largest defeat. But even so, uh, there were shades of victory. And there were um, examples, incredible examples of leadership, fortitude. And even though ultimately there was defeat, um, it is a tremendous example of how Americans fight with their backs against the wall. And it's a tremendous human drama. Gallantry against high odds always are. And this certainly has that as well. So we're going to explore some of those themes tonight. I want to share with you the story, talk about some different aspects of the campaign, some of the human aspects of the campaign, um, and then and, and welcome any questions um, when we get done uh, tonight. Um, so I am now going to share my screen, call up my slides, and um, we'll go ahead and get moving. Can I hope everybody can see this can see this now and can see my cursor moving around. Um, You're good. Great. Thank you. So before we actually talk about the campaign, let's talk about the Philippines in 1941. Let's you need to understand where we are in the world. Uh, the Philippines in 1941 has 17 million people. By contrast, today, the city of Manila Metro Manila has about 17 million people in it today. Um, the Philippines is the largest single archipelago in the world. There are over 7,100 miles that stretch, basically 700 miles from the main island of Luzon in the north, all the way down to Mindanao and Palawan in the south and the southwest, respectively. So it's a very large area um, that is covered. When you're in the Philippines in 1941, you are as far away from the continental United States as you can be and still be on U.S. territory, just about that far. Um, you are 1,500 miles from Tokyo. I'll show you a map here in a minute that will explain, that will give a little bit more visual respect of this. But the other thing I'd point out to you is from Manila to Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, 
It's 5,000 miles. Now, to put that in perspective, I want you to think for a second and realize that the continental United States, basically from Virginia Beach, Virginia, all the way west to San Francisco, is just over 3,000 miles. So between Manila and Honolulu, you can sink the continental United States with plenty of room to spare. Honolulu to San Francisco is another 2,000 miles. So you are 7,000 miles from San Francisco. And for anybody who's been stationed out in the Pacific or has been out there, traveled out there as I have, you recognize the vastness of the Pacific theater. In many ways, it's a theater unlike anything we've ever, the United States military has ever fought in before World War II. The Philippines were originally, were, were colonized by the Spanish for over 350 years, ruled by Spain. And after the Spanish-American War, they are ceded to the United States and become a U.S. possession, as you can see there, in 1898. And over time, the Philippines has been granted an increasing level of independent government. And in 1934, it is created as a commonwealth, a similar legal status that Puerto Rico has today. Um, and at the time, they promised independence in 1946. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. One of the things that comes about this is when uh, the independence is promised, there's also military aid that is promised as well. And this will bring two of our protagonists together and I will introduce them here very shortly. The other thing that I would point out as well is even today, if you look at a map of the Pacific today, you realize Manila sits at very much a crossroads, an economic trade route crossroads in Asia. Philippines have always been a crossroads and a trading sort of community or trading sort of country. Um, Manila, the capital, economically is one of the powerhouses of Asia at this point. It's known as the Pearl of the Orient, um, along with, and maybe a whole other talk for a whole other time, Mike, is the Philippines and in the war's effect after the Philippines, with the Philippines after the war, because Manila loses this title because of the deprivations of the war, particularly the battles in 1945. Um, we'll lose this title, and you can argue where it goes. I would argue Hong Kong, but again, that's another talk for another time. But the point of this is that this is the Philippines in 1941. Um, it's worth remembering where we are um, 80 years ago, as a matter of fact, right about now. Um, and so that's worth, uh, well, kind of worth setting the stage for you there, if you will. The two figures that I just mentioned, two of our protagonists in this story and two of the dominant figures in this story in many ways are these two men right here. They are muchachos, and that is the term that uh, the guy on the left will use to describe the guy on the right. The guy on the left is Manuel Quezon. He is the first president of the Philippine Commonwealth. And uh, he, had, he had actually fought the Americans um, immediately after the session of Spain but later realized um, that it was better to work with the Americans, has devoted his career and his life to Philippine independence. I argue he's the George Washington of the Philippines, if you're looking for a historical analogy. Um, Manuel Quezon was elected president of the Philippine Commonwealth in 1934. Um, a tremendously respected figure, tremendously powerful figure. Even to this day, they actually name a city after him after his death, uh, Quezon City in the Philippines, and a province, Quezon Province. Um, extremely well-respected, extremely important figure in Philippine politics and history. And in 1941, 80 years ago right now, he is about to be elected to his second term as Philippine Commonwealth president. And just within his view is the promised independence of the Philippines. The man on the right is his muchacho. And they have known each other for many, many years through tours of the Philippines, Quezon had known the man's father when the man's father served in the Philippines. Um, and uh, they, they have long connection, long connection. In fact, Quezon will be this man's god, godfather to this man's son, which if you think about it in the 1930s, to have a non-white godparent for a son is a big deal. Of course, the person I'm talking about is General Douglas MacArthur, whose father was a Civil War hero from Wisconsin. I have to point that out as director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, earned the Medal of Honor in 1863 uh, for leadership under fire. Douglas MacArthur was appointed to West Point from Milwaukee, graduates with one of the outstanding cadet records, outstanding combat record in World War I, um, has risen through the ranks very quickly, some of the, one of the youngest generals, one of the youngest chiefs of staff in the history of the United States Army. In fact, he's coming out of that position in 1935 
when Quezon hires him to be the military advisor to the Philippine Commonwealth government. Moves to Manila. Along the way, he meets the woman that will be his second wife and be the mother to his son, Arthur. Um, and they will be with him in the Philippines all through the story that we are exploring here tonight. Uh, but Douglas MacArthur's job is to prepare the Philippine military for independence and to try and get what he can out of, of aid from the United States and train and develop and build the Philippine military. And so these two men have spent, by 1941, have spent basically the last six years of their life, five, six years of their lives, working toward the day when the Philippines become an independent, independent country. And MacArthur, as far as he's concerned, Manila is home. He moves everything out with him, and this is what he'll do, and he'll live out his days in Manila in a uh, glorious retirement um, once the Philippines become independent. He also, by the way, fun fact, is the only American to ever hold the rank of field marshal. He is created field marshal of the Philippine Army. So in our story today, these are two very important protagonists on the Philippine side. It's worth remembering. Um, it's worth spending a little bit of time on these two men. Um, and, and I encourage you to explore their careers and lives a bit more, a bit further, because they are com compelling figures for sure. This is the Pacific Theater in 1941. Let me do a quick orientation for you. So, and I'll explain also how the Philippines fit into this overall plan and how they get sucked into the war. North is at the top. United States, you can see the continental United States over here to the Northwest, Canada, Alaska, North America here off to the Northwest. Um, you can see the distance from San Francisco to Hawaii where I'm circling with my cursor. And then from Hawaii, you can see I'm running my cursor directly over to the Philippine Islands here. In between is Japanese territory at the Marianas, Marshalls, Caroline Islands. Of course, the United States owns Wake Islands. Here's Guam, which was a US colony at the time, still is, still is a US base. Iwo Jima is right here. Okinawa is right here. This area circled in blue is this, what's known as the Southern Resources Area. Dutch East Indies, which we know today is Indonesia and British Malaya which we know today as Malaysia, I'm putting my cursor over those. Here's French Indochina, which is today Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, here's India, China, which of course today is the People's Republic of China, Korean Peninsula, and of course the Japanese home islands here, and looming over everything to the Northwest is Russia, Soviet Union at the time. In 1941, Japan has been at war for four years. They have fought a war in China, and it has, quite frankly, become a quagmire. Um, they have conquered a significant part of eastern China, but China res remains in the war, and Japan has become increasingly stuck in that quagmire. It has increased pressure and tensions with the West, especially because Japan, after the fall of France in 1940, has secured first northern part of French Indochina, and then in July of 1941, the southern half of French Indochina. What that does is that, that causes the British, the Dutch, and the Americans to embargo Japan, to cut off all imports, cut off all uh, freeze ass economic assets. What that means is that Japan now has 12 months worth of oil. They need the, the resources, they are now cut off, from not just oil, but they are cut off from all the resources necessary to keep their war machine going. They are not gonna do nothing. They are not gonna let this status quo play out for very long. They also are not gonna give in to the West and pull back from China and, and basically would admit defeat, the first defeat in war in Japan's 2600 year history. So they're not going to do either of those things. So that means they have to go and they have to seize by force. They choose to seize by force the resources that they need, which are down in this area circled by blue. But I want you to look at the geography here real quick. Notice what is in between the Japanese home islands and the key resources that they want to seize and use for their purposes. What's in between? The Great Highway, just like today, in the Pacific is the South China Sea, which I'm running through my cursor. And what does it run by? It runs by Manila and the Philippine Islands. Japan could move against the Dutch and the British. 
There is opposition in the United States, and there's a possibility that the United States would not move if Japan did not attack the United States, instead only attack the Dutch and the British. But if you're a Japanese strategist, can you really afford to take that chance that the United States may not move and sit neutral astride your lines of communication between the Southern Resources Area and the home islands? No, you can't. On top of all this, after the retaking of the southern part of French Indochina, Douglas MacArthur, who had been retired from the army, was called back to the colors. And a program of training and reinforcements is being undertaken in the Philippines to build up the Air Force. As a matter of fact, the largest Air Force, single Air Force outside the continental United States in December 1941 will be in the Philippines. There are troops and equipment beginning to funnel out to the Philippines. The Philippine Army of over 140,000 troops will begin mobilization and training 80 years ago this month and next, as a matter of fact, August, September, 1941. That process will play out ultimately with a date going into April, 1942. So the longer the Japanese wait, the stronger the Philippines will get. Japan realizes that there are three pillars of allied defense in Asia that they have to take out at the beginning of the war. The first, and I'll go from west to east, is British Force Z, Prince of Wales and Repulse down here in Singapore, which they will sink 72 hours into the war off the coast of Malaya. MacArthur's Air Force, which is building up here at Clark Field in northern Luzon. We'll talk more about there, what happens to them shortly. And the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. That's the genesis of the Pearl Harbor attack in December, on December 7th, 1941, 80 years ago, this coming December. But that's why war comes to the Philippines, is its strategic location astride the Japanese lines of communication between the home islands and the southern resources area. The fact that Manila is one of the best ports in the Far East it is an asset as well. The fact that there are military and air bases here, naval bases as well, in addition to the air bases, makes the Philippine Islands an attractive target. In December 1941, MacArthur, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a minute, his strategy, General MacArthur will have about 140,000 troops at his disposal, of which 25,000 are American, the rest are Filipino. And that's worth remembering, is that this battle will be very much an American battle. The, the Filipinos are an American service, but the majority of the troops that MacArthur will command in the defense of the Philippines are Filipino troops. And that's worth bearing in mind. The Japanese plan for the war is very simple. We're gonna, they're going to launch a series of attacks immediately at the beginning of the war. The idea of knocking out the pillars of allied defense and then invading various various places, Hong Kong, for example, the British port of Hong Kong, the Philippines, Malaya, and extend their per defensive perimeter out basically to the red line that you see here to cut off China, to capture the resources that they need, and also develop enough of a defensive perimeter to hold against all comers. So that's the Japanese war plan in December 1941. And of course, a prime target for that is the Philippines. They will commit a significant part of the 10 infantry divisions that they will commit to this offensive, a significant part will be, will be sent against the Philippines. Um, under the head, head of Japanese 14th Army, under the command of a general named Masaharu Homa. And we'll talk more about his plans actually right now. The Japanese plans they expect, the only, the only colony they expect to hold out longer is Singapore. They expect in 50 days to capture the Philippine Islands. The Philippines, this is a map of the Philippines, as you can see here, Mindanao here to the south, the Visayan Islands here in the center, Leyte, Samar, Panay, several others as well. And then the main island of Luzon is where the main battle they expect to be fought. This is where 100,000 of MacArthur's troops are. This is where the Japanese will commit the majority of their forces with the idea that they will first launch some preliminary landings on the north part of, after taking out the Air Force, will launch some preliminary landings on the northern part of Luzon. And then on a couple days before Christmas, 43,000 Japanese troops of the 48th Division and attached units will land at Lengayan Gulf. Christmas Eve, the 16th Division will land from the home islands, and then they will make a pincer move 
And they expect MacArthur to fight his main battle in and around Manila, where they will crush him. And then after 50 days, these troops, particularly the 48th Division, will be committed elsewhere, particularly down to the Netherlands, East Indies, to conquer that area. Now, MacArthur's strategy, he inherits a strategy that he thinks is defeatist. But it had been a strategy that had been worked on. He had helped work on it, actually, on a previous tour called War Plan Orange 3, WPO3. And the plan was, was Manila was the main, is the main base and the main area concentration, particularly for logistics and for headquarters in this area. The idea was if the Japanese invaded, they would evacuate Manila and it would evacuate to Corregidor Islands and Bataan Peninsula, 30 miles west, astride the mouth of Manila Bay and there hold for five, at least five months while the U.S. Pacific Fleet or other troops fight their way to relieve the garrison before they surrender. So that's the idea. As MacArthur, as MacArthur will later sum it up, he'll say, the idea is, is that uh, if, if the enemy holds Manila by holding Bataan and Corregidor, I hold the cork. That's the plan. That's the general assumption of WPO3. But as MacArthur's training program gets underway, he began, and the equipment begins to come in, particularly modern equipment, modern tanks, artillery, things of that nature. Uh, MacArthur begins to feel a little more optimistic, and he sells this, this optimism to General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff in Washington, and basically comes up, and it's approved December 1st, 1941, a strategy to defend on the beaches, defend at the perimeter, place the Philippine divisions in many areas, potential landing areas, hold them on the beaches, hold the general reserve of the Philippine division, which is the Philippine scouts, um, which are the professional U.S. soldiers, as opposed to the Philippine army. The Philippine scouts have been a part of the U.S. army since the, uh, since really, since the beginning of the 20th century and are a tremendous example of what well-trained and well-equipped and well-led Filipino soldiers are capable of. They are part of the regular U.S. Army as opposed to the Philippine Army, which has been inaugurated, has been brought in lock, stock, and barrel into U.S. service. That's an important distinction to make. There are some U.S. regular units. There are some tank units. Um, they're part of a never-completed armor division that is here, and that's part of MacArthur's reserve. The idea is, is wherever the Japanese land, you hold them on the beaches, you counterattack with the reserve, and drive them off. That's MacArthur's strategy. <clears throat> He's been spending the last few months before the war starts nurturing this strategy, planning the strategy, as I mentioned, it'd be informally approved December 1st of 1941. Um, so he's feeling very confident. He's also expecting that war will not come until April of 1942. So all of his plans, all of his predicate, his, his mobilization plans, all of his logistics plans are predicated on that date. As a matter of fact, in December 1941, a convoy is on its way to the Philippines um, that will never reach because it will be overcome by events. War starts in the Philippines in the early morning hours of December 8th, 1941, because of the international date line. 7.55 a.m. December 7th, 1941 is almost 3 a.m. in Manila on the following morning. And for most people in the Philippines, the war starts with a ringing telephones or radios. And very quickly, it becomes apparent something has gone on in, in, the, in Hawaii. There's major damage. MacArthur is alerted. He gets messages from Washington. Um, and one of the messages comes from Hap Arnold, the head of the Air Force, to his Air Force commander out here, Lewis Brereton. Don't let your planes get caught on the ground. And that's what most people think of when they think of the defense of the Philippines. One of the first things they think of is nine hours after Pearl Harbor, the Far East Air Force was caught on the ground and destroyed. That's true to a point. It misses some very important facts. The Japanese had planned to raid Luzon and had planned to raid Clark Field, where I put my cursor here in central Luzon, where there's uh, 17 B-17s of the 35 in the islands, the rest being down here in Mindanao. There's also air bases on the west coast of Luzon. There's also air bases around Manila. Japanese have planned to strike all of those at dawn. The problem is they run into fog, which delays their takeoff five hours. This is important. 
because Japanese reconnaissance planes are spotted by the American early warning radar that morning. Brereton has been asking to strike. There's some question as to exactly what happens. Um, if you look at some of the paperwork, there is evidence that there was a strike approved. In fact, I've seen the strike order, um, which was dated at 11 a.m. December 8th for a strike that afternoon. 35 B-17s flying over to Formosa against several hundred zeros. I don't know how well they would have survived. In fact, this is a lesson in lack of preparedness. The Far East Air Force is too weak to really be offensive but it's too strong for the Japanese to ignore. And that's why they're going after him on the first day. Brereton, however, when he's his early warning radar network, his early warning spotter network reports that uh, there are planes approaching, Japanese planes approaching, puts his air force in the air. They buzz around for a few hours, don't really see much, lands about 11.45 and then everybody goes to lunch. Where is the war at this point? For most people, it's still just a radio report. Everybody's at lunch, and then at noon, planes start coming over Clark Field, and an officer turns to another one and says, it looks like the war is coming. And as the first bombs start going off, the reply is, hell, it's here. And MacArthur's B-17s, half of his Air Force are knocked out on the first step. If there hadn't been fog, the whole situation may have been different. And Brereton's planes were in the air. They had just landed, however. And so this cruel twist of fate, the way the cylinders clicked just right of chance, produces the result that you see here. And it knocks out a major prop of the, of the Allied defense. After uh, several weeks of preliminary skirmishing and operation, additional Japanese raids inflict more damage on the Air Force. On December 22nd, Hama and his main body land at Lingayen Gulf. And very quickly, MacArthur's strategy, to his credit, he realizes after one day of fighting, after 24 hours worth of fighting, he issues orders to activate War Plan Orange 3. The plan means evacuating Manila and declaring it an open city, which for MacArthur is a big deal because this is home. This is where his wife, this is where his son are, this is where all of his items are. This is home for him. He's also going to have to evacuate Manila and evacuate the supplies and do it in a matter of weeks, what WPO had originally planned to take a little bit longer than that. And a lot of the supplies had been moved around because of the new strategy to defend on the beaches. On top of all this, with the Japanese landing both north and south of Manila, the forces in southern Luzon and in northern Luzon have to hold. The withdrawal to, to Bataan is one of the great movements of its type. We'll get to it here in a second, but even within a week of the war starting, everybody realizes the political implications of this campaign. Dwight Eisenhower said in 1941, when Marshall asked him, what should we do to help? Should we do anything to help? Eisenhower said this, the people of China, of the Philippines, of the Netherlands, East Indies are watching us. They may excuse failure, but they will not excuse abandonment. We have to help the Philippines in some way. And then Franklin Roosevelt on December 28th, 1941, the freedom of the United Philippines shall be redeemed. The entire resources of the United States stand behind that pledge. These statements will be the basis for Douglas MacArthur's famous I shall return speech later. That way that's getting ahead of ourselves. But it's worth pointing out that even in December 1941, even in Washington, the stakes of Asia, the stakes of the Philippines are very much apparent. And one of the big stakes before anything else can happen is the survival of MacArthur's army getting them into the Philipp getting them into Bataan. They have to go from Manila north through the Plaridel across the unfordable river here at Columpet, where the bridge road and rail bridge are, and then via San Fernando down into Bataan, where there have been defensive positions placed across the peninsula. There are five defense lines that have been set out by War Plan Orange 3. And you can see each of them marked here by the hashes. The commander in the northern part of Luzon is Jonathan Wainwright. Most of his forces are Philippine troops, only a third of which are fully trained. They called up the first third of the army, had trained them in November 1941. They called up the second third of the army, the second of the three regiments of each of these divisions and the division headquarters, and they are in training. After about three weeks, the war starts. They immediately call up the 3rd Regiment. 
So what do you think this means, all this churn, all this um, mixed quality of units, mixed quality of personnel? Um, they are seeing fighting for the first time, and they are fighting hard case Japanese veterans that have seen action in China and have seen action elsewhere. The Philippine scouts, their training is, is outstanding. The 26th Cavalry, also the Provisional Tank Group, 192nd, 194th Tank Battalion, really do a nice job holding. Um, and really, really are backbones of, of holding off the Japanese, while the other units, many of them collapse fairly quickly at the slightest Japanese pressure. In fact, it is the, the, re, the, the Philippine divisions that are having difficulty acclimatizing to active operations that uh, forced the withdrawal, which was originally supposed to be two weeks, pushed to only one. So it's going to take only seven days, what they really need two weeks to do to try and get as much supplies and equipment and what they need to hold in baton for five months. This also produces moments of great drama. One of the big ones is right here on, on New Year's Eve, 1941, at the village of Baluwag, where the uh, Japanese actually push south, threaten Columbus and threaten Plaridel. There's only about four miles between Plaridel and Baluwag. And on an emergency order, uh, two companies of, or excuse me, two platoons of U.S. tanks go to Balawag and fight and win the first U.S. tank versus tank victory against the Axis during the war. And it holds the road open long enough for the rest of the troops to get through Manila. They evacuate Manila New Year's Eve and January 1st, get through and get to Bataan. Japanese occupy Manila. January 2nd, and basically will be a three year and two month occupation from that point forward. The Japanese, by the way, had aimed for Manila. They continued with their plan. They had spotted the, def the movement into Bataan, but discounted it because they assumed MacArthur, their intelligence told them that MacArthur had only 25,000 troops. In reality, as they deploy around Abu Kai and Malban, January 6, January 7, 1942, there are, are 100,000 troops, of which 25,000 are American. There's also 26,000 civilians. They have rations for 30 days. They will begin, they will immediately go on half rations, which means 2,000 calories a day. Later cut March 1st to 1,500 calories a day. And by April 1st, 1,000 calories a day. They will eat two times a day in Bataan. They will eat three times a day on Corregidor. Corregidor had been stocked um, first. Um, and by the end, people will be eating whatever they can hunt, whatever they can fish. Um, the one thing people won't touch really are, are monkeys. Some people feel like they're cannibals when they eat monkeys, but they'll eat anything else. In fact, there's one officer who described eating every type of animal in the jungle, and he said the one he preferred the most was bobcat. They're also able to grow their own rice, but it only goes so far. That's something that needs to be borne in mind, is that these troops, when they get here, are on half rations from January 6, 1942, January 6, 7th, until Bataan surrender on April 9th, 1942. As a matter of fact, um, by the end of the siege, many of these men are surviving on rations a uh, daily ration of less than many of you may have had for dinner, less calories than many of you may have had for dinner tonight. And so that needs to be borne in mind. The other thing that needs to be borne in mind is this is a malarial region. And by the time April comes around, um, the combat effectiveness of these units will be down to maybe one fifth, maybe 20% of normal combat effectiveness. And that needs to be borne in mind as we think about this siege. This battle and the siege on Bataan was fought under some of the most difficult conditions that American, American soldiers ever faced. The Japanese will attack Bataan um, in, in early January, again, thinking it's going to be a quick victory. Um, initially, they are repulsed in and around Abu Kai. Future Army Chief of Staff Harold K. Johnson, who will later be Chief of Staff during the first half of the Vietnam War, actually sees some of his first action here at Abu Kai and distinguishes himself with the 57th Regiment of the Philippine Scouts. They'll then start flanking operations over the rugged Mount Natib, 
between the first core under Wainwright here and the second core under uh, a man named George Parker here and force a retreat halfway down the Bataan Peninsula to this line here in late January. And by January 26th, they've managed to pull all the way back to this line here. And MacArthur will signal, I am on my final position. All possibilities of maneuvers have ceased. I shall fight it out to destruction. And Hama expects that that destruction is very imminent. And so he launches a couple of attacks. He sends an attack down the West Coast through the first core line here. He sends another attack down the center of Bataan into the left flank of second core here. And then he sends elements of his elements of another regiment, a couple of battalions, to land amphibiously on the west coast of Bataan, cut this coast road, and hopefully catch the main headquarters and base facility here at Miravalis. This becomes known as the points and the pockets. The points are the two points here at Kanawan and Longos Kauaian where the Japanese will land. The pockets become the two pockets where the Jap one of the Japanese regiments is caught and surrounded behind American lines. The other attack against Second Corps fails in very, very difficult fighting. And then for three weeks, the Americans and the Filipinos will fight the points and the pockets. And this is an important moment in the history of the Pacific War because it's now when the Western allies realize that surrounded and Japanese do not surrender. They will fire on uh, surrender parlays. Uh, it's fought with no quarter asked and no quarter given. And at the end, the Japanese will die in the points almost to a man. They will escape. They will fight their way out of the pockets, having lost over two thirds of their men back to the main lines here. And by mid-February, by about February 15th, all Hama's attacks have been repulsed. In fact, the 14th Army is now down to an effective strength of three battalions. This is the first ground, tactical ground victory by American forces against the Japanese in the war. But the army is exhausted. MacArthur's forces, known as U.S. Army Forces Far East, are exhausted. And consider the physical condition. They're now six weeks on half rations, and the rations are about to be cut again. There are proposals to counterattack, but without control of the air, without control of the sea, MacArthur realizes we'd eventually be forced back to Bataan anyway. We have to stay here and hold. Our mission is to hold Manila Bay, the mouth of Manila Bay. The best way to do that is to stay where we are and conserve our strength. This is a taste of victory for this army, for this, Filip this Filipino-American army. But it will not last. Homa requests reinforcements and can be counted upon to come back again. Now, at the same time this is going on, there are developments elsewhere on the battlefront. The uh, Singapore, the British garrison at Singapore, including several relatives of mine, surrenders February 15th, 1942. In early March, the Netherlands East Indies succumbs to the Japanese. And increasingly, this becomes an isolated allied outpost in a sea of Japanese conquests. There's political pressure in the United States and elsewhere to get MacArthur out. The, Philip, the, the uh, Australians had asked for a senior American general to help organize the defense of Australia. And it is that request that tips the scales. And President Roosevelt orders MacArthur, directly orders MacArthur to leave Corregidor and go to Australia. Now, when we talk, and I use this as a case study about duty, placing the mission first, those are sound like easy concepts. But when you think about where MacArthur is, what's his duty? His, he's got a duty to the Philippines. His mission, defend the Philippines, hold Bataan and Corregidor. But he's now been given another mission get to Australia, organize the Allied counteroffensive. He's been given a new duty. Which do you place first? How do you balance these competing duties? When you consider the position he's in, and he tries to duck the order, he in fact proposes resigning his commission, but his staff talks him out of it. But when you consider the position that he's in, in late February, 1942, it becomes very clear that these apparently simple concepts actually can have quite a nuance to them. 
And that's a whole case study for perhaps a whole other time, but it is worth considering. And so MacArthur, along with certain elements of his staff, will leave by a PT boat from Corregidor on, this, on uh, March 11th, 1942, two days by PT boat. And then from there, 1,500 miles by, P, by B-17 to Australia, where when he arrives, he will say, I came through, I shall return. Filipinos will take that to heart. And the fact that the United States later will keep the promise, alone among all the colonial powers will keep that promise, goes a long way toward explaining our position in Asia today. But for the men on Bataan, that's not good news. As one of the generals, division commanders there would say later, Clifford Bluemill, he would say, we've lost our luck. And in the 31st Regiment U.S., they would say it became currency to say that uh, I'm going to the latrine, but I shall return. There's also a reorganization of the Philippines that takes effect, partly from the War Department and partly from MacArthur. The forces, which are now about 80,000, um, the forces on Bataan will be under the command of this man here, Edward P. King, formerly the Chief of Artillery for MacArthur. He will take command of what is known as Luzon Force. It's an Army level headquarters, Major General Edward P. King of Georgia. And then this man will take over MacArthur's role as defender of the entire Philippines, Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright. We've already looked at him a little bit earlier, commanding North Luzon Force. And so he will command here on Corregidor with a garrison of about 13,000, 14,000 Americans and Filipinos. So these are your two protagonists as your main protagonists on stage for the Allies as March begins to turn into April. General Hama has received considerable reinforcements, veteran divisions and artillery, and he launches his last attack on Good Friday, April 3rd, 1942, and will strike where you see the arrow pointing toward Mount Samant. We'll launch a hurricane bombardment and launch a power drive with a reinforced division and a brigade into this central part of the Second Corps line. The troops will counterattack, we'll commit all reserves, will push forward valiantly, but by April 6th, it becomes very clear that the battle, the battle has not gone, has not gone the Allies' way. And the Japanese begin to push down the roads here, Lamai, Lamau, reaching, you can see April 7th, April 8th, and pushing down toward Cobb Cobb and late in the day. General King, who has orders for, from Wainwright, no surrender. MacArthur is ordering a counteroffensive from Australia. You must not surrender, is told by his staff, sir, if we hold for 24 more hours, the battle lines will be in among the hospitals. General King realizes that his command is clearly beaten. There is nothing that he can do. His troops cannot hold. They cannot stop the Japanese. All he basically has left are the Philippine scouts. Everybody else has uh, mostly through hunger, some disease. It has finally taken its toll. And the army, the army he commands, Luzon Force, is <clears throat> not capable, not capable of effective resistance for much longer. And so to prevent massacre, he decides on his own to surrender. General King had grandfathers and uncles. He's also the son, son-in-law of a Confederate general. And he had sons, and he had relatives who'd been in the Confederate army. He grew up with the, uh, the story of Robert E. Lee at Appomattox. And he leans on that story as April 8th turns into April 9th of 1942, of April 8th and April 9th, 1865. He even quotes Lee and says, I must go see the Japanese commander. And here's the quote, I would rather die a thousand deaths. Now, on the morning of April 9th, 1942, on his own responsibility, something he would later believe throughout captivity that he would be court-martialed for, but never was, he surrendered the 76,000 Americans and Filipinos of the Bataan garrison. The Japanese will then bombard Corregidor for four weeks, a bombardment so severe that it, it actually reduced the elevation of the island by 10 feet. And once one uh, survivor of the bombardment described later that uh, it looked, the surface of the island looked like the Mojave Desert. And then they will invade, invade Corregidor the night of uh, May 5th, morning of May 6th. The defenders, which are scratch troops, survivors from Bataan, artillery units, and a regiment of the United States Marines gives as good as they can. But when the Japanese are able to get tanks across, Corregidor has no tanks. 
limited anti-tank weapons, Wainwright realizes the inevitable is upon him. And he surrenders Corregidor with it, the rest of the islands, May 6th, and in the days following in 1942. And with that, the Philippines defense is over and the darkness of occupation falls on the Philippine islands. It was not a battle in vain. Not only did they disrupt the Japanese timetable of conquest by holding out five, six months, personnel were able to escape. Also, lessons about Japanese tactics, weapons, and other elements of fighting, the battles that had been going on had been transmitted and had been spirited out so that the forces training and preparing in the United States could use those lessons on the battlefield in the future. But nonetheless, those lessons and those positive effects, not to mention the inspiration that it has provided to the Allied world and will continue to all through the war, Remember Bataan joins Remember Pearl Harbor, along with the battle cries among the Americans, it has been very, very dearly bought when you consider the human cost of what has been done, of what the results of the campaign are. Here's the surrender of Corregidor outside of Malinta Tunnel. It's now a national park in the Philippines. If you've ever been out there, you know what an evocative place this is. If you have never been out there, I encourage you to go see this place. It is a tremendously important battlefield in American military history, and it is worth exploring, both from a 1942, but also from a 1945 perspective. <laughs> Let me give you the, some, some contemporary assessments of this fighting and what it means and why it's important. MacArthur, the day after Bataan's fall, the Bataan force went out as it wished, fighting to the end its flickering forlorn hope. No army has ever done so much with so little, and nothing became it more than its final hour of trial and agony. He's right. If you want an example of how Americans and their allies fight with their backs to the wall, Bataan and Corregidor are superlative examples. And I'll give the last word to Franklin Roosevelt, which to me is the finest tribute to what those defenders of the Philippines did, despite incredible handicaps, they were able to pull off, all things considered. This is to Wainwright, just before Wainwright announces the surrender of Corregidor and destroys communications. The American people ask no finer example of tenacity, resourcefulness, and steadfast courage. The calm determination of your personal leadership in a desperate situation sets a standard of duty for our soldiers throughout the world. In every camp and on every naval vessel, soldiers, sailors, and Marines are inspired by the gallant struggle of their comrades in the Philippines. The workmen in our shipyards and munitions plants redouble their efforts because of your example. You and your devoted followers have become the living symbols of our war aims and the guarantee of victory. That message would sustain Wainwright through three and a half years of extremely adverse captivity. And to me, there is no finer tribute as to what that garrison of the Philippines did and what this campaign meant to World War II, to the Army, and to the United States. And I encourage every single one of you, I thank you for your attention tonight, and I encourage you to learn more about this campaign because it's important, it's, there's inspiration, there's instruction, and it is a tremendously compelling story of the United States Army and of World War II. And so with that, again, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, that's a little quick commercial for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, we do have uh, some questions. Uh, this first question is from John. Would you please discuss the last mounted U.S. Cavalry charge on 16 January 42 near Morong? I'm proud to have been a friend of Lieutenant Colonel N. Ramsey, DSC, who led the charge. Uh, yes, um, that's a great, great question. Actually, I'm going to slide back. I'm going to slide back to the map and show you where it is and why it's important. Uh, what we're talking about here is this town here, 
Moran on the uh, northwest coast, as you can see, of Bataan. Here's Alangapo and Subic Bay, by the way, if you're familiar with the Philippines. Some of you may have been stationed there or passed through there at some point. Basically, what happens is the, the 26th Cavalry is mounted cavalry. In fact, they will. the only reason they will dismount is because they have to eat the horses in February of 1942. Um, in fact, General Wainwright, who's an old cavalryman himself, will say, will, will say, eat my horse first. But I digress. So, but you need to understand that it's mounted cavalry. And the Japanese, as they're moving into Bataan, the 26th Cavalry is part of the screen basically to, pro, to, to be the, the security force, the outposts, listening posts, that sort of thing. Um, and as the Japanese move into town, Lieutenant Ramsey gathers a squadron, squadron and a half of the 26th Cavalry and in, in an effort to delay and disrupt the Japanese and buy a little more time for the defense to organize itself a little bit further south, will launch a mounted cavalry charge against the Japanese and fight through the streets of Moran. And then having thrown them back, it's basically a horse cavalry version of what the tanks had done a couple of weeks before at Balawan. But after that melee was done and after Ramsey, quite frankly, catches the Japanese off surprise, they weren't expecting a uh, cavalry charge. It's a tremendous action. And uh, then withdraws back to the main defense line. Until Afghanistan in 2001, when Task Force Dagger goes to war on horseback. This is the last horseback action in American military history. And as correctly pointed out by the questioner, um, this is the last mounted cavalry charge in the history of the United States Cavalry. And what Ramsey did was, was incredible, and he was justifiably, he and his men were justifiably recognized for it. Um, the 26th Cavalry uh, deserve, it deserves more recognition than it's gotten, and I, I appreciate the question. And did Ramsey survive the war? He did. He did. He actually became a guerrilla in the Philippines and uh, aided the liberation. He grouped, he gathered a, a guerrilla band in central Luzon and helped aid the liberation of the Philippines in 1945. Came home. There's a great book called Lieutenant Ramsey's War, and um, he did some writing about his experiences also. His it's one of those truth is stranger than fiction sort of stories, his war. Um, if you wrote it as a novel, nobody would believe it. But it's incredible from the Mount Cavalry charge to all those years as a guerrilla to helping with the liberation of the Philippines. It's just an incredible, incredible story of his career. The next uh, question is from Barry. Uh, he asked, MacArthur had 107 P-40s and two radar sets. How well did he employ them? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, the radar sets were not, a, not one was set up, the other one wasn't set up, and they were not fully tested when um, the bombing starts. It's, it's a similar situation to the radar set at, um, at the north end of Oahu, you know, where they're still testing it, they're still training it, they're still figuring out what this, this new thing called radar is. Um, the spotting network actually was, was better. Um, the P-40Es, some of them are caught on the ground, Others, uh, again, the raid, and I didn't talk about this so much, but I will now, um, at a, um, not far from Alangapo is IBA Airfield, IBA. And um, there was a bunch of P-40s that were coming in to land low on fuel when the Japanese raiders show up. And so many of them are caught in the landing pattern and are just are shot to pieces. The P-40s that they had were very good. And the problem is, is that they hadn't, the flyers had just arrived in the Philippines and had not been properly trained how to fight the Japanese. Whenever you fought the Japanese, the Flying Tigers had figured this out even though with their P-40Bs. Um, you dive, you climb at the zeros, you dive, power dive at the zeros and do a running fight past them. Don't try and dogfight the Japanese zeros because if you do, they will outturn you, they will outmaneuver you, but you have more power. The American flyers in the Philippines hadn't necessarily learned those tactics yet. They learned them the hard way, and many of them, many of them, never learned it because it, they were shot down in the process of trying to learn. Um, so the Air Force, it was a problem of training, it was a problem of bad luck getting caught on the ground, and it was a problem of technology, as well. Uh, this question is from Ed, uh, who comments that your treatment of MacArthur is balanced and fair. Uh, to some, he became dugout Doug. What is your assessment of that treatment? 
it's interesting because for the men on Corregidor, he was never dug out dug. Um, he actually ex actually would would be seen exposing himself to the bombardments um, quite a bit on Corregidor and was a visible presence on Corregidor. He only visited Bataan once, and many people on Bataan held it against him. And they, for them, he was dug out dug. They're the ones who write that that song, you know, dug out dug lies a shaken on the rock, safe from all the bullets and all the sudden shock and so on and so forth. Um, it's interesting. It, it's, you know, many of the truths we cling to defend, depend greatly on our own point of view. The point of view of Bataan, I understand why they, they felt like he was dug out dug. They felt that way about everybody on Corregidor. Here we are exposed in the jungle. Here we are dealing with all of this. And these people are hanging out, you know, in a fortified tropical island in the middle of Manila Bay, sunning themselves. At least that's the feeling of many people on Bataan, particularly when they find out that Corregidor is eating three meals a day as opposed to Bataan's two. The people on Corregidor, on the other hand, in some ways envied Bataan because, yes, they were on a fortified island, but they were also a prime target. Corregidor averaged four air raids a day from mm -hmm. December 29th, 1941, until it surrendered. And that's not a pleasant experience by any means. Uh, but the nickname dogged MacArthur, and for many people, he's never lived it down. He's also never lived down, for many, many people on Bataan, he never lived down leaving even though he was ordered by the president. There are many people in there, and even descendants of people who were captured on Bataan that never forgave MacArthur for leaving, even though the president told him to go. Uh, this question is from Dave Wilman. Uh, he wanted to know, are there any issues with MacArthur saying, I shall return rather than we shall return? Did MacArthur's statement protect him from being relieved as was Kimmel and Short for their failures on December 7th and 8th? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, and it, it's, I'll, I'll give it to you in two parts. First of all, I shall return, we shall return. Um, MacArthur, MacArthur's audience, the, the, the American, he, he did get questions from the United States. Why don't you say we? But his audience wasn't the Americans. His audience was the Philippine, Filipinos. He knew that to Filipinos, the United States was kind of the shadowy thing halfway around the world. They didn't really know, but they knew MacArthur. They knew MacArthur as the embodiment of the United States. And if MacArthur said he was coming back, they would take that to the bank. And that's exactly what happened. So his audience, he's speaking to the Filipino people. And by the way, Kazan came out by submarine shortly after MacArthur evacuated the Philippines as well. It's worth pointing that out. So there, there would be a government in exile for the Philippines um, throughout the war. And then the Philippines government was restored by MacArthur during the liberation. Um, so that, but that's what MacArthur's thinking. In terms of why he didn't suffer the same fate as Kimmel and Short, um, the short answer of that is, is he was on the battlefront. The Japanese invaded the Philippines very quickly. And he had a chance both to resume himself, but also he was in an, on a, he was in an active campaign from the morning of December 8th, 1941, as opposed to Kimmel and Short, where there was an air raid. And then Hawaii basically became not peaceful, because there was always a threat that something could happen again, but there was no immediate follow-up. There was no additional attacks by the Japanese on Hawaii. So Kimmel and Short, there could be a reckoning. They couldn't do that with MacArthur, a function of distance, but also a function of the fact that, that there was an active campaign. And it gave him a chance actually to redeem himself and kind of fight his way out of some of that and become a national hero. And at that point, how do you fire a national hero? Uh, this next question is from a gentleman whose name I cannot pronounce, but he's asking, in relation to the guerrilla action after occupation to assist with the liberation, what other additional readings would you recommend? First and foremost on um, the Philippines is the Army Green Book volumes. Um, the Fall of the Philippines by Lewis Morton, and then Leyte, The Return, and then Triumph in the Philippines by Robert, both by Robert Ross Smith. Those are the foundational accounts of the Philippines campaigns. My book, you can get on Amazon, Last Stand on Bataan. We heard about that in the introduction. This talks about the defense of the Philippines, 1941-42. I used some documents that were unavailable and were also classified um, at the time that, that Morton wrote his book and John Tolan wrote his book, But Not in Shame. 
which is also an outstanding account. Um, and so I stand on their shoulders. But if you want to start anywhere uh, with the Philippines and World War II, I would start with those three volumes of the U.S. Army official history. Um, and then from there, you can go from there. Uh, there's some outstanding scholarship that's come out of the Battle of Manila in 1945 um, by, my, by, by some of my colleagues. Um, but I, again, I would start with the Army Green Books. Um, this question is for me. Uh, sure. You talk about lessons learned, that uh, information was being fed back uh, probably to U.S. ground forces or back to the states. Have you ever done a, a, a trace on where those documents are? And did you ever open any of those documents? I did open some of those documents. Um, a lot of the headquarters papers were spirited out by plane and submarine and today are at the MacArthur Memorial in Norfolk, Virginia. And in there is a lot of the message traffic that was sent out and it's the copy at origin. And of course there's a copy at receipt. Um, and flipping through there, they sent messages of what Japanese tanks were like, what grenades were like, um, the assessments of the rifles, assessments of the units, assessments of tactics. Um, you'll see those papers. Some of them flown out, some of them are sent by submarine, and some of them are sent by radio. Um, but those are, those are available um, for researchers. Um, and I know I've seen those copies. I would imagine the other copies would either be at AHEC or would be at the Center for Military History. Okay. Um, but the, those, I, I've actually opened some of those and they are, they're actually quite descriptive. They'll draw sketches in there and they'll do all kinds of things, explaining Japanese weapons and how they're used. Do you know that information was passed to the Marines? I do not know that. Um, I do know that there was some information sharing, particularly when you look at some of the joint amphibious exercises and joint training that the, the first division and the first Marine division undertake in the summer of 1942. Um, but in terms of exactly what was, what was shared, I'm not completely sure about that. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Well, Chris, we have, we have no more questions from the audience. Um, so would you like to make some closing comments? I'll just simply um, do a quick commercial for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, if you don't mind. No, if you tell us where the locations are and what they can see at the various locations. Absolutely. Uh, we are the State Military Museum of Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, Wisconsin National Guard um, had a unit in, in one of the tank, one of the tank units was Wisconsin National Guard. And then the Wisconsin National Guard was, was helped liberate the Philippines in 1945. So this is a story that is near and dear to our heart up here. We are the State Military Museum of Wisconsin. There's our website. We do a lot of great online programs, much like here. Um, you can see our website in or where we are in downtown Madison. We are free. Um, you can see some of our programs there on our YouTube channel. Please follow us on Facebook. Please visit us. And certainly if you're coming through Madison, please come and visit us. Uh, are, you, sure. are you fully open right now? We are. We reopened to the public July 1st, and I am very pleased um, very pleased to be able to say that. We've been closed for 18, almost 18 months. It's nice to be back open. Uh, mask mandate or not? Uh, if you're vaccinated, it's optional. If you're unvaccinated, we do request it. Okay. It's all on our, you can see it all on our website for details. Well, well thanks for, for uh, taking us back a couple of years. Uh, and My also, pleasure. I think what, what you did at the beginning is talking about the importance of the Philippines, even in today's world. Uh, because of its geographic location. Uh, something that quite often, uh, unless you sit there and look at the, the Pacific region, you sort of lose the fact of, of it is in the crossroads of many of those uh, uh, rich resource areas. So I uh, want to thank you. Again, his book is available on Amazon. Anywhere else? Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever, and also uh, wherever good quality books are sold. And it's also available uh, through Kindle, right? Amazon Got Kindle. It. Okay. Yep. So uh, again, thanks. Uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us and, and for active participation. Uh, I would like to remind you that on the 26th of August, we'll have uh, Tom Bossler and Jeff McCausland, both retired uh, Army colonels, that'll talk about uh, uh, their book, Battle Tested Gettysburg Lessons of Leadership for 21st Century Leaders. Uh,